Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, my name is uh, Heriberto Eulisse, and I have the pleasure to introduce you uh, to the first training course of the UNESCO Chair on uh, Water Heritage and Sustainable Development. It is uh, the first of a series of uh, training courses, one of the four training courses that uh, will run in the next uh, uh, three years as well. And the title of this year program is Beyond Museums. So we are going to explore today relevant dimensions of water heritage outside the museums. In the next years, we will have different topics and uh, the 12 webinars that compose uh, um, this training course will focus, all of them will focus on this topic. So originally, uh, this course had to be uh, made in Venice uh, physically. Uh, it was a five days intensive course. And then because of COVID, uh, it was replanned in 12 webinars. So every Friday from today until the 21st of January, we will meet at the same hour to explore different uh, dimensions of water heritage uh, outside the museums with uh, distinguished uh, speakers and uh, we, um, with uh, participants from uh, all over the world. We have more than 70 registered participants from uh, China <coughs> to India, uh, Iran, Morocco, South Africa, Ecuador, Mexico, and Canada. So uh, first of all, good afternoon or Good evening and good morning to everyone. Um, uh, this uh, course will start uh, um, today by introducing some basic concepts uh, related to water heritage from the perspective of cultural geography. And, the, uh, and I'm very grateful also to the Venice University for the support. Uh, to make this uh, uh, activity. This uh, UNESCO chair is hosted at uh, Cabo Tachin, is physically located in Cabo Tachin at the Venice University. And I have the pleasure now to give uh, the floor to Professor Antonio Marcomini. Antonio Marcomini is the deputy rector of the Venice University and full professor of environmental chemistry at the Department of uh, um, Environmental Sciences in Venice. Please, uh, Vice Rector, the floor is yours. Okay, here I am. Thank you very much, Roberto, for your uh, nice introduction. I would like uh, first to welcome all of you on behalf of the Rector of the University of Foscari of Venice, Tiziana Lippiello. By the way, Tiziana Lippiello as a, a human, is a, a human scientist, uh, uh, expert uh, in uh, languages, uh, so is also close uh, to, uh, uh, very sensitive uh, to topics uh, concerning culture. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, she's, um, uh, she's uh, appreciating very much the organization of uh, uh, this uh, training uh, uh, course. In addition to uh, the greetings uh, from uh, the director, uh, also, I'm very glad to open uh, this uh, online uh, training course on the tools for promoting the nature and cultural water heritage organized by uh, the UNESCO Chair Professor uh, Francesco Vallerani. And uh, I must, uh, first of all, to say that uh, I'm a, a lover of water. So I'm loving water. And uh, this love stems, uh, first of all, from my own expertise. I'm an environmental chemist, an environmental scientist. So uh, really thinking, uh, speaking about water, uh, every time I outline the extraordinary uh, properties of this substance. Uh, very simple substance, uh, three atomic substance, uh, H2O. And uh, we cannot conceive uh, 
the the history of the of our planet of the earth uh, without water so basically uh, water in our planet is the key substance the most abundant substance the substance uh, uh, driving uh, the energy transport. So the energy in the environment would not move from one place to another place without uh, water. And the water uh, is uh, everywhere, living, non-living environments. Uh, water uh, is uh, under the, the, the three uh, uh, physical states of the matter. So we have liquid water, solid water, uh, vapor water. And uh, so we are uh, really uh, engaged uh, uh, completely in the water fluxes. So water uh, uh, is uh, uh, as liquid and solid uh, uh, visible. We can touch uh, uh, ice and, uh, and uh, river water. We cannot uh, touch uh, the, the, the vapor, uh, so invisible, but we know that uh, water is uh, continuously moving. So the mobility of water is uh, responsible for the uh, weather conditions, for the climate conditions, uh, and the alteration of the biogeochemical cycle of water is the result of anthropogenic impacts responsible for the actual climate change. So water is a fascinating substance. Is uh, again, the carrier of life. So the nutrients, the substances that are used by living organisms to survive are carried by water. No water, no life. Uh, accordingly, a lot of knowledge and then a lot of science and then a lot of techniques and technologies were developed uh, around the concept of uh, how water uh, uh, can be studied, can be used in order to support uh, uh, the life on the earth and especially the human life. By the way, the most successful civilizations in the past were those able to understand and manage the water fluxes. So according to these uh, few considerations, uh, I'm uh, uh, again very glad to open uh, this uh, uh, training course uh, about uh, the uh, heritage, uh, uh, the water heritage, uh, the culture uh, developed uh, around and by water because uh, uh, this culture is uh, definitely uh, fundamental for linking uh, the knowledge, the science, the technologies uh, with the human behaviors. So culture is of utmost import importance uh, uh, to uh, make humans uh, better uh, than they are actually. So, uh, in addition uh, to, uh, to the plea, we need to love more water. Uh, I uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, Francesco, Valerani, uh, Eriberto Ulisse, uh, uh, the staff, uh, all uh, uh, speakers, uh, all participants, uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, this uh, initiative, uh, this course, uh, will be not only useful for the participants, but in general for anyone uh, uh, looking at water uh, from a cultural, uh, scientific, technological point of view. So uh, I wish you a quite uh, fruitful 
e interesting uh, 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 course and uh, and uh, hopefully uh, see you next time in presence at Cafoscari in Venice. Thank you again, Francesco. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Marcomini. We really appreciate uh, also your uh, deep uh, and strong engagement uh, in the field of water sciences. Uh, with the next courses, we will also focus on some topics and disciplines maybe more related also to your field of uh, expertise. We will definitely do that in other courses. Uh, since, uh, and I would like to remind you quickly about the goals of this UNESCO chair course, um, we, um, uh, we want to develop uh, interdisciplinary and holistic approaches. This is one of the main goals of this UNESCO chair. It is addressed uh, to the staff of water museums, but simultaneously also to researchers, to uh, stakeholders, to uh, academics. And uh, um, another main goal is to strengthen the institutional and the human capacities of water museums uh, to maximize their impact to boost local sustainable development, to, um, to provide uh, the capacities, better capacities for all water museums in different parts of the world to be one of the key actors, eh, to engage, to, to interact with the local stakeholders and promote a sustainable development. And last but not least, one of the other goals of this uh, chair is to promote synergies uh, within what we call the UNESCO water family. And within the UNESCO water family, there are other UNESCO chairs, like the one of Professor Michael Skoulos, who uh, today is uh, engaged in the island of, of Crete in another training activities. Uh, with uh, the Asterusia University. I think that Michael is uh, now connected with uh, us. And I would like to give the floor to Professor uh, Skoulos uh, to give another welcome yes. speech. Professor Skoulos is a UNESCO chairholder at the University of uh, Athens and uh, um, for the UNESCO chair titled Management and Education for Sustainable Development in the Mediterranean. Please, Professor Skoulos, the floor is yours. Maybe there are some problems of connections. Hello, Professor Skoulos. It seems it's not uh, connected as we thought, so maybe at a later stage, we will host also the welcome speech of Professor Skoulos, who, by the way, manages also Mayo Exte, which is the initiative on education on sustainable development in the Mediterranean, is a member of uh, the Global Network of Water Museums, also serving in the management board of the same global network. So while we wait for uh, the connection with uh, another group of uh, um, uh, students and researchers in the island of Crete, I would like to introduce uh, Sara Lucchetta, Dr. Sara Lucchetta. Can, can you hear me? Hello, uh, Michael, hello. yes. Yes. I just introduce you. Uh, uh, okay. with the course Thank that you are managing now in Crete. And please, the floor is yours if you would like to say a few words. Thank you very much indeed. As um, perhaps as you explained, we try to link actually the two uh, universities the, uh, that are both uh, under UNESCO, um, organized by UNESCO chairs, and actually our uh, university here uh, is something is on a tradition that has been uh, uh, started in 2012 uh, with the uh, very well known to you um, Bureau of uh, Science and Culture for Europe, which is based in uh, the UNESCO 
uh, office which is based uh, also in uh, Venice and we have with us uh, from this office um, Mr. Jonathan Baker with us uh, also in this room and um, in fact um, the, uh, these universities uh, bring together um, postgraduates, but mostly also uh, managers of biosphere reserves uh, of the program Man and the Biosphere of UNESCO. And uh, as uh, you may know, uh, this, uh, these sites are uh, uh, some, there are now uh, some uh, 727 uh, sites uh, that are. Uh, um, combine um, conservation, conservation and uh, management of uh, resources, among which water resources, to sustainable development. They are recognized internationally as perhaps the most appropriate uh, laboratories of sustainable development under the scheme, under the uh, uh, a, a, the, 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 the scheme of UNESCO. And uh, uh, what we uh, have this year here is also emphasis on water and marine water, fresh and marine water. And uh, we are at the moment in the uh, center, the research center, the national uh, um, center of uh, marine research in, uh, in Crete. Um, uh, the Asterusia, uh, is, uh, Asterusia Biosphere Reserve is uh, one uh, is a reserve that uh, was designated last year, but uh, today we had the opportunity to give the uh, formal recognition, the papyrus, the certificate, uh, and uh, we had uh, this ceremony uh, earlier. It is very important for, for your group and our group to understand the different ways to combine protection of cultural heritage, protection of natural heritage and sustainable development. It is, uh, uh, it is of utmost importance to, uh, to link, to make this link which was not so obvious in the previous years. The link between conservation, uh, which is not any longer a, a museum conservation, it is a conservation that um, strengthens the roots of socio-economic and cultural links between uh, past and the future. And I think this is the message that also uh, our network of uh, water museums brings. And uh, here, uh, for many years, we have a big tradition on education for sustainable development linked with that. And uh, uh, I understand that uh, our colleagues also in the University of Foscari, but also uh, the, uh, our network of, of um, uh, water museums uh, have uh, this very high in their agenda. I don't want to take more time. We are going to follow the first uh, lecture and uh, at a given moment we have to continue also with our own program. But this has, uh, I think, a, a very strong message, a symbolic value, showing that what we are doing is connected. We recognize the complementarity and also the opportunities that uh, UNESCO, UNESCO chairs, but also new technologies offered to all of us in order to uh, reach actually uh, the, the young, the future generation, but also the current generation for the benefit of the future. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to exchange directly with the professor uh, Valerani, but uh, I, uh, I, we are going to follow very closely your uh, achievements. Thank you very much, Professor Skoulos. It's a, a really a pleasure uh, to share with you the beginning of our training course. And uh, congratulations again to the Asterusia Men and Biosphere site um, that has been endorsed 
by UNESCO, uh, the goals of the Mine and Biosphere program is very much linked to what we are going to discuss in the next 12 webinars concerning uh, the uh, concept of uh, uh, sustainable development and conservation. These two key uh, di dimensions, these two key concepts are very central to uh, all issues that uh, we are going to explore together. And so now I have the pleasure to give uh, the floor to Dr. Sara Lucchetta, who coordinates uh, uh, the training course. Please, Sara. Thank you very much, Roberto, for giving me the floor. And thank you to everyone uh, that uh, has spoken, uh, have spoken up until now. And I'm really, really happy to have you here, all here today. And I'm really honored about the um, appreciation and the interest you showed and uh, you are showing in this training course. And I really hope that this training course that will last for 12 weeks will give us the chance to know each other, to um, will be a space and a time to, to exchange experiences and to have the chance to debate on the value of water heritage in the frame uh, above all of sustainable development and uh, of community development. So I'm very, very pleased to have you here. And um, well, a couple of technical uh, aspects of our meetings. Um, soon we will start with the first webinar. So you will have the, um, we will have some time for answering questions after each presentation. So please, if you have any questions during the intervention, you can write them on the chat in the chat box and uh, we will have the time to reply. And uh, if you want to pose a question after the speaker has uh, uh, finished the intervention, please just raise your hand using the, the Zoom reactions that you can find in the bottom right of your screen. And um, another, another aspect, another dimension is that this meeting uh, is being recorded. And I will share with you the, the recording of the, of the meeting with, um, via Vimeo with a restricted access video. So you can just take advantage of the video also afterwards. So now I am really honored to, to present, to introduce you the first speaker of the, of the training course, of the whole training course. Okay, another technical dimension, please just um, be sure um, that your microphone is uh, off. Thank you very much. So we can just go on. And um, yes, I, I'm very glad to introduce you the first speaker of the training course, which is also the chairholder of the UNESCO Chair on Water Heritage and Sustainable Development, Professor Francesco Valerani. Well, Professor Valerani teaches cultural geography, sustainable tourism and territorial development at the Department of Economics at the University of Foscari in Venice. He is a prominent figure in the field of geohistorical evolution and conservation of fluvial and lagoon landscapes. And he is scientific advisor of the Global Network of Water Museums. He is co-editor of the groundbreaking volume Waterways and Cultural Landscape, published by Routledge in 2018. Moreover, he led extensive research on a hydraulic heritage and sustainable tourism in many countries of Europe, in Latin America and Africa. Today, Professor Valerani will uh, contribute to our course with an intervention on inland hydrography, blue corridors, riverscape, and small waterfronts. So, Professor Valerani, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, dear Sara. Thank you to all the audience, all the international participants. I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled to, to, to start and I feel as well the responsibility to, to be the first one. Um, so um, uh, before 
all I want to, to share with you my uh, my screen. Um, sorry, this is one. Okay. okay, I do hope you can uh, see uh, the presentation. Uh, 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 uh. The more. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> first of all, I uh, oh god, what's happening? I want uh, yes uh, to to um, to thanks absolutely. I want to to thank the the strong work. Uh, that Sara and uh, Roberto uh, they did uh, along during the, the months before the, 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 the starting of, of this training course. And that all, their contribution was so generous and so remarkable, helping us uh, to, to set up this, uh, this, the program to contact the, the speakers. So you can imagine behind this uh, training course, the, there was a very, a very hard work to, to organize the network. At the same time, I want to thank as well the, the University of Kafoskari that uh, host us in this gorgeous building that is Kabutachin. So we had uh, some uh, rooms in, the, in this uh, beautiful palace in the core historical center of Venice. So, and uh, here you can see where we are located and uh, hopefully we can uh, you, you can join us uh, in, a, in a future, I mean, in a safer future, in order to, to, to go deeper with our relationship. Oh, my talk, uh, we try to focus on some basic elemental aspects um, that are the, at the core of the relationship between cultural study and uh, um, waterscapes. I try to enhance the role of growing awareness about the hydrosphere. Um, my talk will be structured, structured in the following summary. So um, three parts, uh, introducing water heritage, the idea <clears throat> of the hydrophilia and the recovery of waterscape as blue spaces. Introducing water heritage. Um, it's important to take into account the role of the, the most meaningful geomorphological features in the um, world surface are related to waterscapes. So surface hydrography can be also considered as a, a very important uh, um, repository of uh, water heritage. And I want to start with uh, um, this map, an historical map of uh, 1709, a watercolored map, is one of the thousands of maps uh, concerning the, um, the territory, European territories, and most of these maps are related to waterscapes. So this is a map that uh, where we um, affecting concerning the, the, my, the case studies I'm uh, dealing with, uh, trying to, to share with you. So we have uh, the Venice Lagoon, the Venice Town, and the inland. The inland that you can see is a, is a collection of watery typologies of water flows, flows coming down from the Alps and Pre-Alps. Um, first of all, I wanted to, understand, to, to share with you a methodology and that is <clears throat> based on some pivotal um, Books, uh, texts uh, referring to the most important traditional cultural geography that is uh, connected to, to Dennis Cosgrove uh, works. Uh, the first one is social formation and symbolic landscape, but the second one is a collection is a, a, of uh, works. He worked together with uh, Geoff Petz, and the, the specific title is Water Engineering and Landscape. Um, Way, um, we can arrange for you papers that I will uh, uh, send you in PDF uh, so you can have uh, some information, some access uh, to this, uh, um, to the topic I'm dealing with. Um, other interesting works uh, in, and texts are that one of Peter Coates is a, a modern historian 
And uh, it's very nice, very interesting, this text, because uh, it demonstrates the role of uh, the interdisciplinary historical sciences, territorial sciences, and also fine arts studies. And uh, we will say very soon this kind of relationship. Uh, Matthew Gandhi worked on uh, urban waterscapes as a special um, um, development of research concerning the role of modernization, how um, Western modernization was based especially on uh, liquid power. Liquid power is a great book, a great text of Eric Swingado. Uh, by the way, all these authors I mentioned with these texts, you can have access on, uh, through YouTube. Um, there are many opportunities to listen their voice. There are many conferences, uh, lectures, especially Eric, uh, Eric's uh, um, Swingado. And finally, I quote this uh, collection of uh, uh, papers I edited together with Francesco Vicentin. It was um, concerned. Yeah, Sorry. Uh, okay. Waterways and cultural landscape. Well, um, before starting uh, to go deeper in my, uh, sorry, what's happening here? I wanted to, to, um, to, to give some information about the methodological approach. So whatever case study we decide to deal with, it's important to consider the peculiar local geography. So the, the physical geography and the human geography. I try to, to understand, to, to, um, to share with you the idea that uh, um, every water case study is a territorial pattern, easily recognizable wherever, wherever we are. So if I am speaking with a case study concerning the inland of Venice, I try to give you the tools, the methodological tools to replicate or your research in whatever other waterscapes in the world. So uh, it's actually possible to emphasize this, a common explanation and the interpretative remark you can uh, adopt in your specific uh, um, cultural context. It's so fascinating to know that uh, the audience is a, world, is a worldwide audience. So with many case studies that you are um, you are trying to, to develop, to consider, to study, to, to analyze, and so on. It follows that uh, the cultural heritage is uh, linked to historical waterscapes. It's important the historical point of view that cannot be separated from local freshwater ecosystems. Um, Professor Marcomini and the uh, school have just introduced as on the important relationships between ecology and uh, mm, human geography or territorial studies. So we are facing with uh, a specific waterscape that is uh, also, a, mm, we can say, uh, um, a cultural hydraulic legacy. For instance, in the, in the left, you have a painting that is telling us the story of how was managed the, 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 the gradient of rivers going from the Alps to the, to the, to the coast. So the, the energy that can be useful to, to start water mills. On the other picture, you can see the idea of dwelling very close to rivers. In the, that small villa is a pre-Palladian villa. It's possible to understand the connection through waterways, not through uh, roads or uh, other uh, ways with the carriage or the wagons, uh, horses, because there was a seasonality of the possibility to have access from the inland area to Venice. So if you recall back the, the map of, uh, I have just shown you about the, our inland, in the past they brought the, the, the engineers, people uh, sketching maps, Take, took into account only waterways. So we have also intangible historical and cultural um, aspects to take into account. And uh, 
Also, um, don't forget the role of uh, hydrography is made not only of natural rivers, natural streams, creeks, and so on, but also of the artificial hydrography, historical canals, uh, um, ditches for drainage or for uh, reclamation, or, and so on. My talk at so it, it will be being based essentially on northeast is with this uh, peculiar geography. Here you can see the um, for the foreigners that don't not are not so um, used with the European geography. This is the top of Adriatic Sea. That is uh, the northern, the northest, the most northern area of Mediterranean Sea. So we are at the very top of the Mediterranean area, where we can say um, Venice Lagoon is a small portion, Venice Lagoon, of a very impressive array of coastal wetlands that starts from Ravenna, which is at the south of uh, Delta del Po, that is one, the main river flowing the Padana Plain, that is, and uh, you can see the morphology, the geomorphology of the Delta Po, that is, uh, um, uh, with the siltation, is creating Delta. Delta is, uh, we, we can have a thousand of Delta all over the world, but it's important to, to understand the, the geomorphological pattern of formation of a Delta, that is replicable everywhere. I, I try to remind you the, the geographical thought of uh, Alexander von Humboldt, uh, the great geographer and explorer that uh, at the beginning of the uh, um, 19th century, he elaborated his methodology of comparative methodology. It's a comparative, it's, it's a very important to take into account this heritage, cultural heritage of our um, discipline. So, um, the most complex uh, network of wetlands of the Mediterranean Sea, of course, we have uh, the Delta, Ebro, Delta River, Ebro, um, the Rhone River Delta, the Nile Delta, and so on. Anyway, going deeper into the area of the case study, we have the Alps, Prealps, a plain, and, and the network of rivers descending from the Alps and Prealps going straight to the uh, shorelines. Um, so we have some special two where we, is Venice and the wetlands along the Adriatic. We have two, the, the interaction between two dynamics, fluvial dynamics and the marine dynamics. The marine dynamics are mostly constituted by waves movement, the tidal action, and the winds. So we can understand that what could happen in the future if the uh, ocean rise is, uh, um, is rising uh, more and more. Um, it's uh, important uh, to, to consider the action from the river. It, it's important also for a, a lot of, uh, of reasons, but also I want to focus on the geomorphology of this uh, uh, runoff, specific uh, runoff. It's important to understand the, um, the energy due to the gradient in case of a flood of heavy rains that uh, interact with the phase of uh, drought that um, and it's important to take into consideration the sediments load in the riverbed um, so too many too many fluvial morphology uh, we have uh, especially considering also in the uh, eastward, uh, the case of a Tagliamento River. The Tagliamento River comes from, here is the border between Italy and Slovenia and Austria. And the Tagliamento is typical for his braided feature. It's an important river, it's considered one of the most natural river in Europe. So there are specific uh, um, agreement, international agreement to protect this river, due um, to its uh, um, geomorphological dynamics. Um, other small rivers are the river that comes from the line of springs. And uh, here we have a lot of minor rivers that uh, um, we try to study in the past with an European project to uh, understand the transformation of a human um, evolution of society and of landscapes. 
here are in the core, this picture is taken from, we are really in the core of the urban sprawl. So it's amazing to find in this context of very strong urbanization that uh, is uh, the Veneto region, some corridor of uh, green way, we could say, or also I define, trying to define them as a linear oasis of uh, green and blue in the middle of the strongest urbanization, one of the strongest urbanization in Europe. So it's easy to define this past from natural springs to uh, historical rural landscape, where you can see the transformation of the uh, hydrographic network, where straightening the, the meanders and the reclamation plan. So is the result of uh, water management. And the, the culmination of this uh, transformation, I usually say uh, very frequently also when I with the, the um, Professor Costco, the role of Palladian landscape. So Palladian landscape, the, the activity of the architect, we, we can't understand the activity of Palladio if we don't, we don't take into account the management of rivers, canals, uh, ditches, because the villa is a phenomenon of agrarian uh, interests uh, that Venice tries to foster, especially when Venice, Venice shifted from sea trading activity to agricultural interests. So it's a, a geohistorical uh, consideration that uh, help us to understand the evolution of landscape. All these uh, um, gorgeous experience of transformation of, of landscape through um, the phenomenon of the, the villas, there are not only Palladian villas, but thousands of villas all over, is one of the, the signature of the, that make so typical, so uh, uh, fascinating the, the Veneto uh, region. We have to take into account also minor experiences. We can say, um, define them as vernacular competencies that are expressed by these minor buildings that tell us the story of a, a very strong relationship between population and the exploitment of agriculture. This is uh, uh, water mills that can be useful to, to mill. Um, uh, flower also to move uh, um, pre-industrial activities. So these are small scale interventions. So um, among these small scale interventions, we, also, we can also include uh, small shipyards, bridges, uh, small fluvial waterfront, uh, and so on. So it, it, it's a, a, a general landscape that is uh, uh, based on the water management. A century of this evolution join us at the, in the post-modernity, we can say. So it's important to, to recover all this memory, especially because most of these infrastructures, that's important, are abandoned. So the role of water museums can be um, the opportunity to take into account this tradition, these abandonments. And we work a lot with this, especially with the, the Museum of Battaglia Terme, very close to uh, Padua and Venice, working not only with the objects, but also with uh, uh, the objects in the territory. So many times with the Roberto, we speak about extended, extended museum, the concept of something that it will be um, treated by Edo Brichetti, the, the concept of uh, eco-museums. So coming back to Battaglia, it's important, uh, it was very important, the work of collecting all the photographs, also recording stories. And here we have some people, all the people that are the, <laughs> our uh, source of information because through their enthusiasm, their um, capacity to collect uh, stories, and they helped us, they were the protagonist of the setup of the museum. It's important also uh, to foster a special interaction between these 
last actors with the students from primary school to university students because they are living repository of memories they can explain the story because an old photographs without their explanation is Of, death, of those images. So, uh, um, connecting me to the uh, photographs, I want to start a, a very short uh, uh, speech about the iconographies, the important iconographies. The term has a plenty of meanings. Iconographies are not only photographs, paintings, engravings, but also literature, literary texts, cinema, movie, movie, and so on. Um, the iconography is uh, very well connected to the idea of representation. And the representation is a cultural structure that interacts con with the society. Um, so starting um, with the, um, re being related to the idea of hydrography, I want to mention here the huge uh, heritage of fluvial landscape painting is uh, really a huge repository of water memories. So river and canals, but also boats and the riverine villages are very often artistic subjects. 18th century Venetian view painters, for instance, Canaletto, Bernardo Bellotto is uh, um, um, the, uh, are so important in define the role of iconography, especially because they tell us the story and we can also be able to, to, to understand, to interpret at best our territories. I have just to mention, this is the case of engravings. So from engravings, a very detailed um, and uh, uh, precise, uh, um drawing drawing of the, the uh, river banks in uh, 18th century but there is an interesting story is this collaboration between a water engineer that is cornelius Meyer, <clears throat> and a young painter that is gaspar from Vittel. and they worked together because they were appointed by the Pope in uh, the mid of uh, um, 17th century to explore remonting the Tiber River in the middle of the Italian peninsula, trying to understand the possibility to make some intervention to make easier the navigation, the flowing, the downstream navigation. And uh, Cornelius von Wittel improved uh, his uh, expertise, his uh, ability, and he became a uh, uh, an important painter, a Flemish painter that mostly based on in Rome. And here you can see one of his paintings, most famous paintings that are very important to, to recover the history of the vernacular life along the Rome banks, the, the river Rome banks, the, the river Tiber. Another one is very, very useful. This is the harbor. So that you can understand the position, the, the, the kind of uh, transportation and so on. Flemish painting is huge, <laughs> absolutely fundamental in working on this, in this sense to recover the, the story of the past. Um, other school of painters are the Hudson River School. In the Hudson River flows from um, the painter, the, the, the most important was Thomas Cole. Thomas Cole worked from New York to Albany, going upstream in the Hudson River. Another school of painters is the Hag School in the Netherlands, but we can't but mention the Impressionists, the French Impressionists. When we consider the French Impressionists, we have to understand the sense of aesthetics and the arts, the mention and the affection towards these uh, uh, the, the rivers. These last remarks allow me to approach the following section. This is another author that uh, was um, uh, Gilpin, William Gilpin. 
it's important because he invented the, the, the term picturesque. And that this the term picturesque was invented when referring to the Y River. The Y River is a small river, very small river, um, the catchment of a Severn River. It makes the border between Wales and England. And uh, he, he tried to describe the, the landscape, the fluvial landscape of this river. It's, it's uh, amazing to find the, the building of the theory, the theory of aesthetic that was born considering waterscapes. And now the idea of hydrophilia that is fundamental to understand why this affection for the beauty of, of waterscapes. Um, what is hydrophilia? Um, just a few remarks before to go deep this concept. It's based on the attractive, attractiveness of the flowing fresh waters. Flowing, that means the noise of rapids, the smell of water among trees, the color, the difference. There are many different colors of water. So it's important in the aesthetic evaluation of the uh, waterscapes. So there are very narrow relationship between such a cultural um, attitudes and waterscapes appreciation. Um, when facing waterscapes, try to speak, uh, to think about our perception, our individual perception. Please, let's make uh, an effort of uh, introspection of our perception. It should be a good exercise, I think. So um, when we are facing, facing waterscapes, uh, uh, we are affected by a wide array of emotion. I try to, to make order. So we have, we can define them emotional waters. So it's very different if the water body is a, a, um, a calm waters of a lake without winds, a lagoon, or a river very close to its mouth. Or um, it's very different the other situation. When we have a rainfall, um, a waterfalls, rapids, roaring rapids, the sound is changed completely. And also the smell. So it's important to, to make this difference. Also because there are different water mobilities that can be, uh, that entail different touristic approaches. For instance, the case of, uh, we have, uh, anyway, the, the water mobility is the perfect interaction with the hydrosphere. Because when we feel floating on the water, we change completely our terrestrial, ancestral heritage. Because we became something different, M much more when we swim. So it's, much, it's very important to consider this embodiment in the waterscapes. So it's worth remain, reminding you the relevance of uh, uh, scholars, a very old uh, uh, contribution in 1985. It's very old, uh, almost 40 years ago, but it's still quoted in many um, uh, recent researches on the, 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 the issue of uh, human preference for waterscapes. I can, um, maybe I have the PDF of this uh, text. I I'm very, should be very happy if you could access it and to read and to understand what is the, the meaning, because it is basic, this, this, this text. So aquatic environments are anyway a favorite place. It follows from what I have uh, told until uh, now, in so far, um, that water museums activities should take into account uh, that waterscapes are not only cultural heritage, but uh, waterscapes are also leisure recreation and they can become our museums a touristic destination in order to uh, improve uh, the um, theoretical approach to sustainable tourism, for sure. A great deal of enjoyable activities uh, are, can be performed on, uh, on water, for, for sure. Um, water-based, uh, more action in water-based uh, activity are um, 
walking, biking, angling, or swimming, plunging, throwing flat stones, and so on. So this is activity not um, intellectually demanding, but on the other side, the calm waters or other kind of waters can help us to develop other activity, like plein air painting. I've just mentioned the, um, the impressionists. So it's important for impressionists uh, the sense of beauty that uh, came from the riverscapes or the, the, the waterscape. Another activity is writing or meditating. Again, the Y River is another writer that uh, through these uh, um, books, uh, he, he try to express uh, the sensation, the, the feelings, uh, staying or walking around along the river, the Y River banks, or An Inland Voyage. It's a great book. I suggest you to read, uh, can be translated in many languages by Robert Louis Stevenson that uh, tell the story of uh, a mobility with a canoe he, they were two people canoeing from Antwerp in Belgium uh, up to Pontoise in France. So it, it, it's a, a story of a waterscape of perception transforming into a literary text. So this is another kind of iconography. It's a representation, another kind of representation that helps us to understand what I'm trying to, to, to say you now that is, uh, uh, hydrophilia. But what's about hydrophilia? Hydrophilia, uh, the, the term comes from a, a very, very famous book of Yi Futuan. Yi Futuan is a cultural geographer that in the 70s of the last century, he wrote this book, uh, trying to express the emotional relationships between human beings and places. In the same way uh, that uh, Yi Futuan uh, developed the, the concept of topophilia, we can say hydrophilia. Hydrophilia is an ancestral perception concerning aesthetic experience, ancestral myth that comes from a very, uh, our experience uh, um, very embodied in our um, emotion, mood, and so on. And it's uh, an essential connection with the physiology and vital needs. Um, the, our senses, especially sight, smell, hearing. Um, and uh, this, that's why humans have throughout history preferred to, set, to settle close to waterscapes. So we, we, we can say about, uh, we can start from biological attitudes to cultural evolution. A, to, a, a cultural evolution from cultural evolution depends the construction of symbols. Every society has the necessity to express symbols. And for this reason, I quote this connection between the first settlement of Venice, that was the lagoon, the backwaters, the marshy, the muddy islands, that was transformed in, in the century in something that is the culmination of urban aesthetic, starting from the uh, backwaters and muddy islands. Some determinist geographies uh, call, define this uh, passage from the backwaters to the built city as the theory of uh, the challenge theory. That means that uh, in a deterministic view, when you have uh, an environment very difficult to survive in, it helps society to elaborate strategies of survival that are very um, important that can uh, out can transform the the previous the pristine environment in something of totally completely different. But I repeat, I disagree with this because it's a deterministic point of view. There are so many other. Um, uh, aspect that is better to, to forget. So um, we now can, uh, we are looking at the, the time. I try to be on time. So uh, human societies assign indisputable shared values to waterscape and also to waterfronts because the waterfronts uh, uh, is the possibility to connect with the river, with the artificial canals. 
is the um, inter is the point of contact of two different worlds the wet the watery world and the, the land world so what could be the role of water museums within this uh, cultural framework within the ideal hydrophilia um, Yes, we can take for granted that the, the human behaviors, uh, closed waterscapes, uh, induce uh, positive effects. And the environmental psychology can help us uh, to interpret this approach. So it's very important to think about the blue space because from blue space, we can have uh, uh, mental health and well being that are the, the is it's scientifically proved this very strong relationship. On the other hand, we have also some problem at, at the moment, especially because uh, uh, we can also speak about the water is waterways turn or waterscapes turn. I agree with this uh, question because uh, not only this, uh, the, the, the answer to this question could be based on uh, human physiology. We have also to consider what is happening to date. So we are uh, facing an increasing freshwater depletion, the quality of our rivers, the pollution. So waterways, uh, we have to consider not only waterway as uh, or waterscapes, especially waterways, as cultural corridors, but also blue space. That means something that are uh, vivid thanks to fresh water flowing. So uh, we are we have to consider also the activity of our water museums to consider the incorrect management of fresh waters. So there is an urgency to deal with the worldwide decay also of the inland hydrography as a cultural asset. So there are new attitudes. Fortunately, the awareness is increasing, not only among people, riverine people, people living close to riverscapes or waterscape, but among a large uh, section of uh, citizenships that are more, more and more sensible to what is happening to the uh, environmental uh, problems. Finally, the recovery of water escape as blue space. I go faster now. So uh, water museum is a foreground to expand the shared sensibility. Our task is to improve this sensibility, to start also discussions about uh, recovery action, because there, with the architects, uh, with the um, scholar of the ecology, environmental studies, uh, with the water engineers, uh, um, stakeholders, political stakeholders, and so on. So the connection uh, between waterscape and waterways uh, has to be rediscovered through the uh, necessary idea, the strategic role of blue space. And I wanted to stress again the role of emotional geography. If stakeholders are not able to empathize with the um, waterscapes, it's very difficult to get good results. So it's important to take care of the emotional approach. It's not something of uh, to, to, or secondary. I discovered in years and years of research that when we have emotional involvement, every project uh, can have uh, the best result. For this reason, every single water museum is like a, a cultural tool, a tool to improve new social awareness, dealing with waterscape quality. First of all, there is an, an urgency, a strong urgency, especially uh, yeah, we have some books that can help you to go deep, especially this one, the Hydrophilia Unbounded, Blue Space, Health and Wellbeing, because the problem are there. This is the problem we are dealing with. Here we are in New Jersey, the Passaic River is a very well-known, is a well-known river where some action are trying to recover the ecological quality 
also within an uh, urbanized area. Yes, also within urbanized area. We have to start from these rivers, but it's much worse in other areas. Here we, when you see, I speak about the Buriganga River or Sitarun River, the most polluted river in the world. Here we can speak really about the landscape here. So when you speak about the plastic in the ocean, but from where does the plastic come? The plastic comes from inland rivers. It's important to start the protection in a worldwide connection between freshwater issues and ocean issues. If other water museum that most of them works on work on a freshwater area, inland rivers, we have to not to forget that bad uh, good uh, behaviors can help not only rivers or hydrography of fresh waters, but also the oceans. That's a very, very strong relationship. So, hydrography, urbanistic therapy, all terminology that I try to, to, to tell you also because we need to consider the fluvial sense of place. What is fluvial sense of place? It's a, a a, co a, a coexistence among people and their water environment. Very often geographer, human geographer speaks about uh, um, uh, sense of place. Okay, it's good. But fluvial sense of place, watery sense of place, it's important because it involves not only the um, physicality of the river, the canal or the lake and so on, but also the intangibility of the heritage. So the memories, the affects, the emotions, so it's important, I think, um, to train people, young people, mostly young people, to be uh, not be ashamed to be have an emotional relationship with hydraulic features is fundamental. Because at the base, if we have emotionally involved, we can have best practices when involved, when planning, when managing. Um, the the network of uh, hydrographic network. Um, so it's, it's important for this. Um, this is a picture coming from one of the thousands of miles of uh, artificial canal in uh, in England, and the um, canal river is working is making of recovery the awareness among people. In order starting, yes, they, they started considering leisure, tourism, it is a mundane activity, not so intellectual, but it helps, absolutely it helps. So it's a remarkable opportunity for new policies. New policies aims, should aim at increasing biodiversity to protect the biodiversity, managing freshwater supply, because you will is ranging from awful, dreadful. I do hope you remember what happened between Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany in July, last July. It's important to remember we have huge floods and long, long drought. drought. So there is something is happening. And everybody knows what's happening actually. So it's important. Uh, this is a, a multifunctional task that must we must give to water waterscapes. Also, balancing the ne negative effect of urban sprawl. So today, hydrogra hydrography network, especially minor rivers, are a strategic environmental resource in regional planning. And uh, here you are some good example of this planning. This is a case of uh, um, reclamation board, a technical board that is working, is managing the immediate inland of Venice Lagoon. So they try to reestablishment of meanders and the, very nice because the nature react at the best. The nature get the best out of it. So it's clear this cooperation, very fruitful cooperation. The meandering is a new strategy Every, a lot of countries are trying to remeandering what in the past was straightened in a very hard, very hard, heavy engineer approach. Also to remove the concrete uh, banks from uh, 
uh, drainage uh, uh, ditches to give back, to give room, to give floor to the expression of biodiversity is so important in uh, area of uh, urban sprawl. And this helps us uh, to our interest of mining to, to, to start from a bottom up uh, uh, approach because most of the local community are trying, are asking, are demanding to policies, to policy maker to improve, to ameliorate the, the, the flowing structure of the uh, hydroscapes that are um, characterizing our territory. So um, I want to, to conclude now, trying to express this uh, last uh, aim. Uh, you are a lot of people, the audience is a worldwide audience. And I think that uh, worldwide hydrography is a, a, an endless repository of water related stories. So you can have a lot of sign in our territories that can tell us stories, can tell us that are waiting to be to be collected, to be reevaluated, to be surveyed. And in order to, to make a general holistic vision of our territory. So as a water museum, I want to share with you the strong responsibility we have to make a good education to involve not only students, young people, but also to spread our knowledge, our uh, scholarly and the citizen science, we can say, uh, through, uh, among uh, the people living in the area of our museum, in order to stop uh, the loss of memory, the impoverishment, environmental impoverishment. So we need uh, to retrieve the sense of the hydrophilia. Thank you very much.